want to talk about this morning, this season that we celebrate called Easter, where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he was raised from the dead. But three days earlier, he was crucified. Three days earlier, he was beaten and mocked and hung upon a cross. But on the third day, when the S-U-N rose, the S-O-N also was raised from the dead. Did you know there's been no greater moment in all of history? It's called a watershed moment. Everything else flows from that moment. There's no other moment in all of history greater than the moment of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk about those changes that took place and what happened and what was brought to pass when Jesus was raised from the dead. Why did the disciples run? Three days earlier from that Easter morning when he was arrested and taken to be tried in a mock trial, actually the night before his crucifixion, he was taken in the night. He was dragged through a mockery of a trial, a totally illegal trial that never should have taken place as it did, where it did, how it did. And it was a travesty of justice, and he was proclaimed guilty and dragged to Pilate with a demand that he be crucified. When they arrested Jesus, the disciples ran away. Why did they run away? While he was going through that trial, John, who had relations with the family that was hosting this mockery of a trial, was able to witness the trial and was able to even get Peter into the outer court there around and as they were observing everything that was happening, Peter even denies Christ and curses and runs away in shame. The disciples are found even after his resurrection huddling in a, in a room afraid. Why were they afraid? Why did they run? Because of what always was. Because of what always was. Why are many people living in Friday today? Why are many people living in that place where they're running in fear, where they're hiding from other people and hiding from their emotions and their feelings, hiding from themselves? Why are they doing this? Because they're living in Friday and they don't understand uh, that Sunday morning has come. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 47, I want you to turn with me to the passage of Scripture where Jesus is being tried in this mockery of a trial. And in verse 47, we find where he is arrested. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. In verse 47, with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. He responded with bravery, but not understanding what Jesus was trying to accomplish. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? There was an old song years ago, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he walked alone up Calvary's road and died for you and me. He said, don't you understand all the host of heaven is at my disposal? I don't need your little sword. It's okay. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? What he was saying is Peter I know you don't understand, but this is what's got to happen. 
I'm afraid that there are a lot of people who come to the point of salvation. They come to the point of being confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They come with a realization of the truth and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And like Peter, we don't really know how to react to it and we're not really ready to submit to it because it's so contra to anything that, so contrary to anything we've, we've ever thought or imagined, those who have never known the Lord, because what, to receive I give, to live I die, to what, none of this makes any sense. For the gospel it says to the world is foolishness, but to us who believe it is the power of God unto salvation. So Peter's not really understanding what he's supposed to do. And so in that moment, Jesus speaks to the crowd in verse 55. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Do you see an army with me? Do you see uh, soldiers? Do you see implements of war? Every day, I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. The reason they didn't arrest him is because he had a great following, and they were afraid of the crowd of those who supported Jesus. That's why they took him in the stealth of night. That's why they drug him to a court case that should never have happened in the night where no one knew it was taking place to ensure that none of Jesus' supporters would have any knowledge of what was going on. He said, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophet might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. He said, you come out here with swords and soldiers and weapons and I just simply sat in the temple and spoke why do you think it necessary to do that look all of this must happen and his disciples fled away because scripture had to be fulfilled you see Jesus had already been trying to prepare them he had been telling them that he was going to be crucified and they were greatly sorrowed uh, sorrowful over that and 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 As a matter of fact, he told them, he had just gotten through telling them, please pray with me, but they were so weary and exhausted from grief that they couldn't stay awake, and now Jesus is facing this trial, this day, this crucifixion alone because his disciples have all run away. Those who had arrested Jesus in verse 57 took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward, they could not bring about a case that would mean his death. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer what is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? I guess Jesus, previous to the fifth ever existing, stayed silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Are you what they say you are declaring you are. There are people who try to tell us that the Bible never says that Jesus really was, that Jesus never said he was the Son of God, that Jesus never really said that he was the Savior. Really? The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say. So yes, Jesus knew he was the Son of God. Yes, Jesus knew that he was the Messiah. Yes, Jesus knew that he was the Christ. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witness? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fist. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ. 
who hit you. And Jesus remained silent. Knowing that all of the authority and power of heaven was available to him, Jesus stood silent. Let me tell you something, folks. The disciples ran because up until this time, they did not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They did not have Christ and His Spirit living in them. They had lived with Him. They had, they had had the Holy Spirit rest upon them, but they had never had the Holy Spirit reside within them. And in this moment, their Christ is submitting Himself to an authority that they, they thought was unjust and the, submitting Himself to something that they thought should never happen. You remember when Jesus tried to tell them that these things were going to happen, some of the disciples said, no, 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 Jesus, this, this can't happen. And he said, you need to get behind me because this must happen. Why do you think I came into the world? This is the very reason that I came here. Now, friends, there are times in our lives where all kinds of things are happening and, and we look around and we wonder what's going on. Have you ever, want, have you ever felt like, Hey, why are the bad guys winning? Have you ever felt that before? You know, I, I, I grew up watching westerns, you know. I mean, my dad loved those old westerns. And so, uh, and of course, back when I was a kid, there wasn't a whole lot else to watch. And those old westerns, you know, I liked it. You knew who the good guys were. You knew who the bad guys were. And by the end of the movie, you know, the good guys win. And then modernity started coming through, and now this new style, you never know how a movie's going to end. You never know what's going to happen. Half the time, have you ever done this? Have you ever screamed at the, at the screen? Are you kidding me? I just spent two and a half hours, and this is what you leave me with? Maybe I'm the only one that does that. I don't even know what happened. Use your imagination. I don't want to imagine. It's what I pay them for. The good guys win, but we know in real life that doesn't always happen. You see, the disciples, why did they run? Well, they knew history. They knew history where time and time again Israel had tried to rise up against authorities and powers, and they were brutally stamped out. They knew. They knew history. They knew that the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the Political leaders of Israel had a stronghold on all power and authority in Israel. They were, they were still occupied by the Roman government, but they were the most powerful people around in that time in, um, in their circles. And brutal tyrants and kingdoms had come time and time again and persecuted Israel and taken them into captivity and all kinds of things. And the poor and the downtrodden had always suffered at the hands of the rich and the powerful. Let me tell you something. The poor always suffer. Now, you can try all kinds of government programs and you can do whatever, but I'll tell you what's going to happen. The rich are going to take care of themselves. And when you do anything to try to fix the problem, who always winds up suffering? The poor folks do. They do. It's always been that way. And I hate to tell you, but it probably always will. There have been every, there's been every form of government in trying to solve these problems. There's been socialism. There's been communism. There's been democracy. There's been republics. There's been, every, there's been dictatorships. There's been every kind of form you can imagine, but always the poor still suffer. Always it seems like that some of the bad guys tend to win. Now... Jesus had come along, though, and he was different. He was different. He wasn't always demanding things for himself. My goodness, he would even pick up the basin and the towel and wash the feet of his own disciples. Jesus was one who walked among the poor and the sick and the infirm, so much so that the, the upper echelon wondered, why do you run around with such riffraff. 
such low-class people. Why do you do that? Why are you always among the publicans and the sinners? And Jesus said, because it is the sick who need the physician. Jesus, even when he talks about the 90 and 9 and the 1, I believe Jesus was saying, you guys don't even think you need to repent. But I've come for the one who needs repentance and knows it. And I'd rather have one who knows he needs repentance and save him than 99 of you who think you have no need of repentance. So Jesus comes and says, what did he say? I'll take one of these over 99 of you guys. So he walked among the poor. He was the one who spared the woman caught in adultery when these religious leaders, these same religious leaders brought her to him and threw him, her at his feet and asked him, what shall we do? And Jesus goes on to say, he who hath no sin cast the first stone. And he began to write in the dirt, and oh, I wish we had a video of that. We don't know what he wrote. But he wrote something that every one of those guys got real nervous and left. Maybe he started writing names of girlfriends. (laughs) Mistresses. Ladies of the evening or whatever. It's kind of like I know where you've been. I know what you've done. One by one, they all left. And she looked at him. And he said, look, neither do I condemn you, but you got to quit doing what you're doing. You've got to go and sin no more. You see, Jesus didn't just condemn us where we are. He came to where we were. He comes to where we are. He walks among us, and he loves us there. He loves us in all of our frailties and our uncertainties and our brokenness, But understand this, he did not come and die on the cross for me to stay in my brokenness. Jesus did not come and die on Friday to stay dead. He came and died on Friday so that on Sunday he could rise. And so within your life, he wants to come and change everything about you. But when you're living in Friday, you run. When you're living in uncertainty, you run. When you don't know and don't understand, you run. You run and you hide. And God knows the deliverance that you truly need. You see, he had caused these simple fishermen, these common men, they were not of the profound, they were not of the wise, they were not of the educated, they were not of the rich, they were not of the upper crust or, or, or echelon. They were just common people. And somehow he had caused them to believe that things could be different. But the problem was they didn't understand how it could be different. You see, they were thinking it was material. They were thinking it was fortune. They were thinking it was power and politics and all of those things. But let me tell you something. If there's any nation that ought to understand this, freedom politically will never equal freedom spiritually. There are all kinds of people who are walking around in this nation today. You may be watching me by live feed or recording. And you are politically free, but you are so in bondage to your sin and the power of sin over your life. There is no political answer to a spiritual issue. Joseph Stalin understood something. That brutal ruler that established the Russian power and kingdom, he said something, and I want you to listen to what he said. He said uh, that if you can control the thinking of men, you can control men. And here's something he said, ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? I want to read that again. Ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? And you know, he also said something else. He said, "There's death can solve a multitude of problems. And he was talking about you. 
If you cause me a problem and I kill you, problem solved. And that's how he operated. And so he looked and he said, I know that if I'm ever going to keep these people in bondage, what have I got to do? I've got to control what they think. Because if they have the freedom of ideas and ideals, they will rise up and not allow me to continually, brutally rule over them. But if I control their ideas, I control their thinking, I control them. Doesn't that sound similar or familiar? Doesn't that sound kind of like the one we are all understanding is the enemy? Don't you know that Satan, it says, for the God of this world, the Bible does, for the God of this world hath blinded the eyes lest the, of, of men, so that, lest the light of the gospel should shine in unto them. The devil knows that as long as he can get you not knowing and not understanding and not recognizing the power of Jesus Christ, he can keep you in bondage. As long as he can get you to look at stuff that isn't what it's really all about and get you to focus on the stuff that's temporal, get you to focus on the stuff that doesn't matter in eternity, then he can keep you under his control. As long as the disciples looked at the kingdom of Jesus Christ as something earthly and temporal, then the enemy had them. But once they grasped the reality that this kingdom transcends the world that we live in, suddenly these men would never bow, never bend, and never deny the Lord again. It is a freedom that comes from within that no kingdom can deny and even death can't remove. Jesus, upon rising from the dead, unleashed the powers of heaven within the souls of men to be free from sin's bondage, uh, which is the greatest bondage of all. That's why Jesus said, don't fear those that can kill the body. Fear the one who can condemn the soul to hell. Don't fear these temporal things. Understand that it is about the soul, the spirit, the mind, the heart. The God that can't be held within the universe has chosen to come to you and me and offers to live within our hearts. That's incredible. And in so doing, he unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us. The greatest source of power in this world is the will of men moved along by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the second most powerful thing in the world is the will of men. But the first most powerful force in the world is the will of men moved along by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when you have the power of the Holy Spirit and the direction of the Holy Spirit, you have all of the power of the kingdom of heaven behind it. The strongest tomb that holds us in death is a captured spirit and a mind in bondage. But Jesus came to liberate the soul and to free the mind of the human clutter and allow it to, be, to, allow it to comprehend the glories of heaven and his character. He takes us from our darkened cavern into his brilliant revelation of who he is and we can scarcely withstand it sometimes. The other night we were at a service and one of the men in Mercy House just Fell out, under the, fell out under the power of the Holy Spirit. And then one guy was there and he goes, I really don't understand all this. I said, well, because sometimes when our humanity comes into the presence of his divinity, our human bodies have a little trouble coping with it. It's kind of like walking out of a dark dungeon into the brilliant sunlight. It takes just a minute to adjust. Friends, I want you to understand that God's meaning to bring to us a freedom that no political power can remove from us. Howard Beecher, a Stowe, wrote that great book, Tom's, Uncle Tom's Cabin, helped to move along the freedom of people in slavery in the United States. And within that book, she tells this story that she was a, godly woman who had a revelation from God and she sat and almost wrote the whole book without stopping because she felt the unction of the Holy Spirit. Because in the book you find that though his brutal master lays the lash upon his back, in one point in the book it says finally the master realized that he's 
He's not the victor because though he can lay the lash upon the outer man, he could not touch the inner man. And that little cabin became his sanctuary where Uncle Tom would go. Friends, I want you to know that this power is the kind of power that can come to a prisoner in a brutal war camp in Vietnam under horrible conditions of torture and make that cell a sanctuary. God can come in such power that Paul the Apostle could walk out to his execution with peace of heart and say, hey, I fought a good fight. I've run a good race. I'm ready to lay it down. And henceforth, I know there's a reward for me waiting in heaven. I remember reading of Richard Wombrand when they had tortured him and beaten him and threatened him and everything. And finally, a man, out of frustration, pulled his gun and put it to his head and said, you either deny Christ right now or I'm going to blow your brains out. And he said, you would only send me on to my reward. The man holstered his gun and said, you Christians, we can't even threaten you with death. Friends, I want you to know that right now, there are brutal massacres of Christians taking place in Central and Southern Africa right now. I can't even share some of the details, but many of our Assembly of God brothers and sisters are being slaughtered and killed and tortured. And the question is, do you believe in Christ? Because if you do, you're going to die. Christianity is under such great persecution around the world. More people are being killed for Christ right now than have ever been killed in all of history. But let me tell you something. It may look like the bad guys are winning. But I know that Sunday is coming. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18 it says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Do you understand what he's saying? He said, he's, Paul is writing, he says, guys, you need to understand there is a power that is so great that it is equal to the power that God exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. This kind of power is available to be in your heart and in your life and to work in your life and to bring deliverance and freedom to you. This is not a freedom of human thought. I want to make that straight. Some people say, well, yeah, so you're saying God is a God of enlightenment, so he frees our mind, frees our mind to human thought and to contemplation and meditation. No! This is not what I'm talking about. It's not a freedom of human thought. No, this is a level far above human thought. He begins to reveal thoughts from the heights of heaven. He enables us to comprehend his thoughts. You see, it tells us in Corinthians, it says, For no man knows the thoughts of another man save himself. But now we have the Spirit of Christ. And now our minds are open to where we begin to understand things that God understands. We begin to know things that God knows. We begin to be able to think God's thoughts taught us by the Holy Spirit. And a God thought can sustain you in the midst of whatever persecution or problem or trial that you might be going through. In the midst of your poverty or your pain or your struggles or your bondage. That kind of revelation can be life changing and empowering. These thoughts liberate the soul, inspire the spirit, and illuminate the mind at a level of power that transcends time and space. Though our human bodies are temporal, these things are eternal. What he's empowered us to do is to change. The power to change. What does that mean? That means the power to believe that what has been will be no more. The title of my sermon today, it may have seemed strange when I gave it to the guys, but the title of my sermon is Not This Time. Not This Time. You see, when I didn't understand 
When I didn't know, when I hadn't comprehended, when I hadn't had the Holy Spirit come and be poured out on me, I ran. But not this time. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me, but when you return, strengthen the brothers, and you just know this, uh, once you understand, once the Spirit gets in you, you will never, ever deny me again. Something changed. What changed? Peter changed. How did Peter change? By the power of the Holy Spirit and the understanding and the revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ and that he is in fact and shall forever be the Christ, the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We no longer conform to this world but instead we're conformed by the truth and by the gospel. And friends, I want you to know that down through the ages, I just jotted down a few words here. Through the ages, God has proven himself to be faithful. Pharaoh, you can't stop him though you try, for his will marches on. Nebuchadnezzar, you couldn't escape him. For all shall be judged by him. Darius, you couldn't resist him, for he moves the hearts and minds of kings. Alexander the Great, you can't conquer him because he causes the rising and falling of many. Caesar, you can't intimidate him, for he is lifted high above the heavens. Dynasties of China, you can't outlast him, for he is the Alpha and Omega. Genghis Khan, you can't frighten him, for the host of heaven follows him into battle. Stalin, your human will could not match his eternal will, for your king kingdom has fallen, but his marches on. Nietzsche, you didn't kill him, for you're dead and he still lives. Hitler, you can't exterminate him. Your furnaces have long gone cold, but the fire of the Holy Spirit is still burning above the heads of the 120 and within the hearts of his children this very day. Crescent moon, you will never fly above him, for his banner spans the stars, and his holy mountains shall come against you. Hell couldn't stop him. The grief grave couldn't hold him. The sky won't contain him. Words can't describe him, and no knee will escape him. But the humble heart of a man can receive him because he did it all for you and me, sinners saved by grace. Give him praise, somebody. He did it all for you and for me. The God of the universe, of which there is no equal, came and gave us life so that you and I could be free. Free what? Free to be changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever bondage you are in here today, whatever trial you are going through, as our men come and prepare to serve communion this morning, I want you to know that there is no trial, there is no tribulation, there is no place, there is no bondage strong enough to hold him back for his deliverance will come to you if you will allow his spirit to live in you. That was the difference in the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They lost their fear because they knew no man nor death could ever bind them again. I'm not going to tell you that if you give your life to Jesus Christ that everything's going to come up roses and you're not going to have any problems, that you're not going to have any struggles and suddenly your poverty is going to be turned to prosperity. It may, it could, and it might not. But I want to tell you this, there's a victory that transcends prosperity because you can be rich and be bound, but you can be poor and be free. Hallelujah. And there are many who are rich and would give it all to be free. There are many who are wealthy and would willingly give it away to have peace. All the time we are seeing the rich and the famous and the powerful who end their life because they can't deal with the demons of themselves. But you, you have a risen Savior. Now, friends, we have open communion. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're welcome to partake of communion. And I challenge you, if you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, but you want to, go ahead and take the cup and the bread, and I'm going to give you some instructions in a moment. 
when he comes and you face your nemesis again after he has come, after he has risen, after he has deposited his Holy Spirit in your innermost being, then suddenly what you have always crumbled before, what you have always fallen prey to, suddenly something in you rises up. It's called the Spirit of God. And you say, not this time. Devil, I may have just fallen down and given up in the past, but this time I'm going to get up. And I'm going to keep getting up. And I'm not going to give up. I'm going to get up. And I'm going to overcome because I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And I know that none of this stuff that you bound me with before, none of this stuff that you badgered me with before, none of this stuff that you kept me in bondage, intimidated me with, is ever going to work anymore because not now, no more. I will not accept what you have said. I'm going to live on what my God and my Lord and my Savior and my King and my returning King has said over me. You see, there's a strength inside of us that no political power can remove. Not even death can take from you. Lord Jesus, as they pass out this communion cup this morning, and this bread, I know that there are many who would say, how could you possibly imagine that just saying a few words to some supposed power out there somewhere Eating a little piece of bread and drinking a little bit of grape juice is going to change your life. How could you possibly believe that? Well, because I've encountered the one who rose from the dead. And he showed me that no matter what has been, I can live in a place where it will never be again. Where I will be free. Whether I'm politically free or not. I shall live, whether I live in this life or whether I live in the life to come. I shall live, for Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Lord Jesus, I pray that this will so grip our hearts this morning, the revelation of the risen Savior. That as we partake of this bread and of this grape juice, that we would recognize that it symbolizes us partaking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, meaning that we believe that he came as our sacrifice, as our atonement, as our Redeemer, died upon a cross for our sins, cleansed our sins by the shedding of his blood, and now by his stripes we are healed by His power we are delivered. By His Holy Spirit we are empowered. By His blood we are made clean. Yes, Lord, I believe these things. Would you stand with me, congregation? I contend to you this morning by the authority of the Holy Spirit and His Holy Word that if you will believe in your heart, that Jesus is the Christ, and that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that word saved, you, you know what I'm talking about. I've been telling you this morning what it means. It means that tomorrow you look at a situation that's always been the victory in your life and say, not today, not now. Because I'm not who I was, and I will never be again. Because I believe Jesus Christ came to give me the power to change, died for me, and then God raised him from the dead to prove that God would do what he said he would do. You see, how many of us would be willing to go to death? Jesus did because he knew he was going to raise him. 
you got to have that kind of faith. It says, God, no matter what, I know you got this. So, Jesus, if you're here, I want you to bow your heads. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, this is what I want you to just pray it in your own words. Jesus, somehow I believe. I don't know. It's your Holy Spirit is drawing me, wooing me. And I know I can't even believe unless you give me the power to. But I feel your Holy Spirit drawing me. And right now, God, I, I, I want to believe and I desire to believe and I, I long to believe even that you are the Savior and the Christ and that you can give me the power to change and you can set me free from all these things that have bound me all these years. God, I believe that Jesus came to give me that freedom. I, I believe he came to set me free. Freedom that no money can buy, no political power can, can grant. It only comes from you, God. And I want that freedom. I want that peace. I want that that Christ paid for. And it says that surely the chastisement of our peace, our punishment was upon him. Jesus, as I hold this bread, I believe your body took my punishment. And so, Lord Jesus, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And flesh and blood have not revealed this to me, but the Spirit of God. In my conviction right now, under the Holy Spirit, I confess, Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And your body was given for me. Can we partake of the bread? Now you've got to take the next step. Can you look here for a minute? There's a lot of people, I'm afraid, they eat the bread, but they never drink the wine. They believe that Jesus is the Christ, but then they never allow him to apply the blood. You see, because Jesus, how does he apply the blood? Jesus said, this is the ink of a new covenant. You see, you got to make a covenant with God. That's what he said. He said, my blood is the, basically the ink of a new covenant written in my blood. This morning you're saying, not only do I believe Jesus, but I covenant to be yours and you be mine. And for the rest of my life, I choose to serve you. I choose to believe that you paid the price for my sins. And I believe that as I partake of this cup, this new covenant will cleanse me of all unrighteousness, purify my soul, make me clean, and establish a relationship between me and the eternal God that will last for eternity. And saints, can you say amen? amen. Then, Lord Jesus, upon my profession of faith in you, Upon my willingness to make covenant with you on this Easter morning, you who laid it all on the line, you gave your life for this covenant. You shed your blood for this covenant. You wrote it in your blood. And I, God, as I lift this glass to you, I accept your covenant that you are my Redeemer. And from this day forward, my life is yours. And you said you'd give me the power to change because I can't do it in my own, my own self. But, Lord, I know you can. So, Lord, cleanse me, change me, transform me in covenant today. In Jesus' name, amen. Cleansing flow of the blood of Jesus come right now. Friends, if you're in this place and you just made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do something, not to embarrass you or to shame you, but because we want to help you in your newfound faith. We have altar workers and people that can meet with you and talk with you and make sure that you understand and know and that we can pray with you and agree with you and love you and help you be established in this faith if you just made that commitment would you just simply make your way 
to an aisle and come and stand across the front of the sanctuary so that our altar workers can come and talk with you for a moment and to pray with you and so that we might intercede for you. Come on. Right now. You say, Pastor, it's embarrassing. Jesus hung on a cross naked for you. Hallelujah. Any others this morning? You want that freedom that he promised that we could have. You want God to do that miracle in your life. Today's the day. Just come humbly, quietly. You can go to a side and you don't have to walk right down the front. Hallelujah. All to workers, would you come? Can we sing it, saints? Uh. I'm Lori. Thanks for joining us. Here at Southside, we'd like to help you grow in your relationship with God. For more info and ways to connect, go to our website. From there, you can like us on Facebook and even subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you need prayer, give us a call at the church office or feel free to email us. May God bless you and we look forward to seeing you soon.